first episode of Contours, the Cambridge Literary Studies Hour. My name is Atto Quayson, and I am a professor and chair of the Department of English at Stanford University. I will be the host of each episode. Each episode of Contours will address a pressing issue, theme, or concept in 21st century literary studies. In many of these episodes, I will be hosting a dialogue with an author or authors from the Cambridge University press list. Others will feature a panel of experts in the field, and I will introduce the episode. We aim to provide an invigorating, accessible forum for critical debate and reflection to engage and help students, teachers, and general readers. Contours will range from medieval literature to the present day from all areas of global literary studies in the Northern and Southern hemispheres. Each episode will be approximately an hour long and will be available via YouTube on our Contours page on Cambridge Core. We start Contours with an episode on a new edition of James Joyce's Ulysses, edited by Professor Catherine Flynn from the University of California at Berkeley. Catherine Flynn is joined in the discussion by Vincent Sherry and Daniel Mohal. This edition of Ulysses invites us to take a form of residence within it. The residential invitation comes from the way in which Flynn and her co-contributors have set up a dynamical framework for reading the novel that allows us not only to immerse ourselves in that memorable day in Dublin in 1904, but also to get close to Joyce's own varied editorial choices and the many different efforts at glossing the text that have been undertaken since its publication in 1922. We hope you find Contours, the Cambridge Literary Studies Hour, useful, enjoyable, relevant, and more importantly, that you join us again. Thank you very much. You're all very welcome to the US launch of the Cambridge, Cambridge Centenary Ulysses, edited by Professor Catherine Flynn. And as many of you probably won't have seen the book, let me uh, try and show it to you here. Here it is in all its seven pound glory. Now, let me briefly introduce the panel before uh, stepping aside. Ambassador Daniel Mulhall will be known to many of you for his work on a quite amazing range of fronts of Irish fronts. This year, those fronts included the publication of Ulysses, A Reader's Odyssey. That book immediately became a bestseller in Ireland and was reviewed widely and warmly, uh, including the TLS. In the fall, Ambassador Mulhall becomes Distinguished Professor of Irish Studies at NYU, and in January, he is Parnell Fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge. Each year, I visit the small coastal town of Tremor in County Waterford, population around 10,000. Dan is from Waterford. Some of his family live in Tremor. Such is the pride in Waterford in Dan's many extraordinary achievements that each year in Tremor, about 15,000 people tell me that they know him well. With <laughs> all demands on his time, we're extremely grateful to him for being part of this event today. Vin Sherry is Howard Nemiroff Professor in the Humanities and Chair of the English Department at Washington University, St. Louis. A distinguished scholar of modernism and the literature of World War I, he has a lifelong investment in Joyce. In fact, his family are from Dublin and once ran a pub called The Gay Companion, a pub clearly anticipating important constitutional amendments. About 15 years ago, Vince told me he'd read Ulysses 25 times, so soon we'll be need a panel to celebrate his 50th reading of the novel. Vince was a supporter of this project from an early stage and saw all its potential. He chairs today's event and has our gratitude once again for his input into the list. Now, the undisputed star of today's event, Catherine Flynn is Associate Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. She grew up in County Cork, completed a Bachelor of Architecture at University College Dublin, practiced architecture in Vienna for a BA in English and Philosophy at Cork, then on to a PhD at Yale. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford, she became Professor in the English Department at Berkeley, itself a notable achievement. Her first book, James Joyce in the Matter of Paris, CUP, 2019, traces Joyce's evolving art as a response to consumer capitalism, drawing on 1970, 19th century avant-garde French literature and Catherine's understanding of Dublin as a modern European city. 
And as everything Catherine does for CUP turns to gold, it is, of course, a best-selling academic title. It's a huge pleasure for me professionally and personally to have this opportunity to say publicly how much we, CUP, the contributors, the readers of this already best-selling book, and I just got an email 15 minutes ago saying it's number one in the Republic's um, uh, fiction charts, which is an extraordinary achievement, how much we owe to Catherine Flynn. This edition reflects her capacious knowledge, her calm professionalism, her passion for Joyce, the esteem and affection she is held in by the Joyce community, and her steely intellectual command of everything such as size of her project entails. She has put heart and soul and a very big brain into it, and it's worked. It was number one on Amazon.com and Amazon.uk in various categories before it was published, and we sold out the first print run almost immediately in Ireland and the UK, with advance, and the advance orders for the US are just great. During Bloomsday Week, Catra was, like the narrator in Ulysses, everywhere throughout Dublin, though definitely not on scene, with events at Hodges Vegas, the Museum of Literature in Ireland, the Joyce Conference, RTE Radio, the novel was review- the book was reviewed in the Irish Times, plus she had a column there. She was a multimedia event. Captain, for all that and for making this book possible, on behalf of the press and for me personally, thank you. We are in your debt. So as we virtually gather to celebrate the US launch of the Cambridge uh, edition of Ulysses from New York City, I raise a rhetorical glass to the people who have made today possible, Vince and Dan, Catherine and our contributors, and of course, Joyce. We thank them all. Vince. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Um, I'm really glad to be here today to serve in this uh, mediating role. Uh, I'm grateful to the ambassador for joining us as one of the Joyceans, uh, and as Dan, uh, and to Catherine, of course, for all the work she did to uh, get us here for today. So Catherine, um, in your uh, wonderful introduction to this volume, uh, you note that Ulysses both appeals and intimidates. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, in more or less equal measures, each side lifting and reinforcing the other. Uh, we want to know, uh, we know more, we realize what we don't know, we want to know. <laughs> it, it, it keeps opening up. Uh, uh, um, I, I think of this in a less sort of grandiose way in, in, as Huck Finn sidling out of that church, muttering to himself after the sermon, the statements was interesting, but tough. <laughs> uh, that's a problem you've taken on, Dan, in, in your recent uh, Reader's Odyssey, uh, uh, companion to Ulysses. It's a companion that is sure to expand the, the novel's readership beyond the narrower, though it's not so narrow anymore, uh, as the sales figures indicate, the narrow academic uh, readership of this, of this book. A- and that book, uh, yours joins in your longer experience in bringing Ulysses into the world, in your diplomatic travels, sometimes in diplomatic channels. Uh, what I've discovered really over the last 44 years of my diplomatic career is that we in Ireland have an enormous resource in the form of our writers, which attract people to us in ways that other aspects of our um, work wouldn't wouldn't achieve the same effect. So, for example, if I hold a Bloomsday event here, I will get senior people to turn up. And uh, I remember once uh, I had a Supreme Court judge here uh, last year at our Bloomsday uh, event. And uh, he said to me afterwards, he said, I never got Joyce before, but now I do. So that kind of exposure of someone of that caliber, you know, obviously a, a, a serious person, a reader, but actually decided that that he got Joyce because he, he, you know, he heard and saw what we were doing at our Bloomsday event, which is trying to make it accessible to a wider audience. That's always been my uh, goal has been to to use Ulysses as and Joyce's work generally as a way of communicating with people from other backgrounds and other cultures. And so, for example, uh, in India, uh, there I, I use mainly a portrait of the artist as a young man because I talked about, in, in a speech I gave there many years ago, I talked about the nets of language, religion, and nationality. Because guess what? They were relevant to India in the 1980s, just as they were to Ireland in Joyce's time. I remember in, in Germany in uh, 10 years ago or more, 
uh, my bloom says there, I always focused on that line. Uh, what is your nation, if I may ask, Mr. Bloom? Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. And I made the point to Germans, and they readily um, recognized the, 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 the power of this point, that if you had, uh, had that definition of German nationality in the 20th century, you would have been spared some of the horrors that uh, your country had to endure as a result of, of having a, a much more um, um, confined notion of, of nationality, which couldn't accommodate, for example, people of Jewish origin who were born in Germany and in many cases were um, generations uh, located in Germany and spoke German and were part of German culture. So, so I think everywhere you go, uh, I found at least, there's a different message to be conveyed um, by Ulysses. And this year I've been talking in particular about the line about force, hatred, and history and all that, mm -hmm. because what does that do? It chimes with the current situation in Ukraine, where force, hatred, and history are on the rampage and where the whole world is now being churned by these forces that Joyce correctly pushed back against uh, through Leopold Bloom 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's such a political uh, novel in that sense. It's not political position taking, but addressing the political as a condition of history and of existence and, and of working into and through that, not with policy, but Bloom's own ability to just keep going, keep going through an otherwise yeah. staggering day uh, yeah. and reaching a, a point of equanimity. Yeah. Uh, and the, other, uh, uh, the other thing I focused on recently as well is Bloom's absolute lack of narcissism, you know, this, whereas, you know, today, I suppose one of the problems that we face is the sort of narcissism appears to be on the rise and it's giving, it's giving rise to, to uh, political consequences in various places. But Bloom is the one who, who, even when he's faced with his wife's infidelity, thinks about the fact that there are actually other crimes far worse than infidelity and he lists a whole bunch of them and then he says anyway the stars don't care so why should i and so he gets into his bed and snuggles up beside molly and and all is well in the world so i think that's also a lesson for today's rather heated world and i also like the description of of bloom as in the oxen the sun as mr cautious calmer and i think these days we might need a mr cautious calmer and i like the idea as well in in, in, in Eumaeus, where he talks about having to look at both sides of the story and weigh up things. So I, I think of Bloom now as a kind of a, as a kind of a, a representative of, of, you know, uh, centrist politics, which I think we probably need a bit more of now in various parts of the world where, you know, the center seems to have been, um, you know, disrupted by, by populist forces on both sides. Well, thank you. It's, um, so I'm wondering, Catherine, if there's anything in that, you know, that, uh, that long list of useful uh, aspects of Ulysses that speaks to you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Vince. And thank you, Dan. Um, it's so nice to be in this conversation with you today. It's such a happy occasion. Um, so, you know, responding to that last question, Vince, and to your first one about, you know, how Ulysses challenges us. And it's a difficult book. It frustrates us, but it fascinates us and it gives us pleasure. And, uh, your suggestion that these two are kind of bound up together, I think is really apt. Uh, you know, there's so much of our contemporary moments that is consumable. And I say this in the introduction, there's so much that is, you know, ready to be swallowed without any thought or any effort. And Ulysses is the very opposite of that. And uh, it's constantly challenging us and everything is challenged. So, you know, we're at a moment now where we're really rethinking Irishness, for example, and this is why Ulysses is a very helpful book for us, because that discussion of the nation, what is a nation, Bloom has asked, and he gives two answers that are really in opposition to one another. More fundamentally, they're in opposition to an idea of ethnic nationalism, um, of, you know, blood and soil, racy of the soil. And this really, I think, speaks to a lot of us today, a lot of Irish people and people in other countries, too, who are really thinking about what it means to come together um, in a state and how that might be meaningful for everyone in the state, as well as the minorities, of whom Leopold Bloom is one. But, you know, I think that this is just one example of how Ulysses takes things that seem self-evident. Irishness, like in 1922, Irishness was achieved in some way that took, you know, a huge amount of struggle and was a question. And Ulysses is able to pose that question or Joyce can pose that question through Ulysses. 
at a moment when it's very bold to do that, when it's very bold to say, this is something that's in progress, actually. And, and so this book is, this is just one example of how this book presents us with all kinds of um, uh, understandings that are works in progress. You know, what it is to be an individual, what it is to be part of a community, what it is to be in a relationship, in a marriage, um, what it is to um, belong to somewhere and to know a city and uh, what it is to read a book. You know, fundamentally, Ulysses presents us with that challenge. And so this is why it really is an odyssey for the reader, where they start off pretty disorientated, as we say here in Ireland, or disoriented in the States. And it just gets more and more intense, but more and more enjoyable. And I think you and I were talking about this before, how it's actually as the episodes get more involved, that readers, students, all kinds of readers find them more satisfying. The more they're at sea, the stranger it gets, the more people love it because it's an adventure and it's they feel their edges growing, their boundaries, their horizons growing as readers and as thinkers. And I think even as people, you know, this is a book that can really help you push yourself into new ways of thinking and feeling. And uh, that I think is something that is um, really welcome for us uh, at this moment. Right, and sort of reversing the somewhat conventional uh, trajectory of moving from problem to resolution. I think this novel begins with the apparent clarities and then yeah. goes on to uh, complicate them by living them uh, yeah. and li living them from the inside out. You know, we, if we forego any obvious involvement in you know, resolving a plot or motivating a narrative, we can get more intensely connected to the experience of reading as reading, the sheer experience of reading, a kind of minute by minute, inch by inch, you know, engagement with the text. And here's what I want to ask each of you: like, how does how how does this uh, new edition affect your experience in reading the book as just a reading experience? What's it like for you? What's the same as of old, and what might be new? Uh, so, uh, Dan, could you start? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, well, first of all, I first read the book, or tried to read it, failed, but tried at least, in the summer of 1974. And that was just the book, the American edition, uh, the 1960 edition, or whatever it was. Um, and, and I, you know, I, but there was, I had no aid at all. I mean, I had, you know, you couldn't even, that was the days before Google, and, you know, I didn't have a, so I, I, I really struggled because I didn't have a support system. Now, Eventually, when I read the book again, I read it uh, with a guide. I can't remember which guide I used, but that was back in the uh, back in the eighties and then in the nineties again. So, so I've had a, I've had a number of 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 uh, immersions in the book of different kinds, and of course, the last few years in writing my book. I have a library here. I could show it to you. Uh, I have a full shelf of books that I acquired about um, Joyce's novel, and so I read the book informed by those but what i would say is that this book uh, is a new bit of guidance that's available in other words you pick this book up and you can read uh, first of all you read the introductory chapter by catherine and then you read the individual introductions and then you read the um episode and then you get on every page you get some help with understanding some of the complexities of it. So for me, at least, that is a different reading experience from the one I had in 1974 in my student accommodation in Kansas City at University at Rockhurst College in Kansas City, reading it with no help. So th this is this is a new helper. This is a kind of a, this is a piece of, of support that's now available. And it's the latest piece of support and it reflects the latest thinking about Ulysses, which I'm sure will be overtaken in 10 or 20 years time. But for the moment, this is the, the kind of accumulation of the views of the, those who are currently engaged in the study of Joyce's novel. And, and that's why I think it's a, it's a worthwhile experience. And I've, I haven't read the whole of the book, but I've read a number of, of episodes that I was particularly interested in. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be teaching at NYU in the fall. And I'm not going to teach Ulysses. I'm going to teach two episodes. I'm going to teach uh, Cyclops and Eumaeus because I'm teaching a history course and I'm going to use those two episodes to enlighten uh, the, uh, the issues to do with the history of Ireland in the early 20th century. 
So Prep, could you speak to that, Catherine? Like how how you know you you obviously put the text together, but you put it together as a reader. You know, uh, it, um, I'm wondering how the how you know how this feels the same and how it feels different for you. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, over the years since I started working on Ulysses in my dissertation. I mean, I read it in Cork first. I tried to read it in London, in Dublin, and then I read it at UCC, actually, in a class with Colbert Carney, but the whole thing. But, you know, so many people have said to me, I tried to read Ulysses, but I failed. Or I wanted to read it, but it was just too intimidating. I had to look and I gave up. So this book is for them. Uh, but it's also for people who know Ulysses. And there are various things to help um, different readers at different stages. So in one way, it's about, you know, um, attacking Ulysses like it's a, a series of mountain ridges, you know, mountain peaks, where you get through each episode and then you have an essay by a Joycean, um, a wonder, like there, I'm so uh, grateful to the um, Joyce scholars who've written these essays. They all did an amazing job. And each one of them provides kind of sustenance for the reader, you know, a summary of the plot, um, a discussion of the most important literary and historical references, um, an explanation of the parallel with the Odyssey, but which is really a set of questions, actually, because Joyce is always bouncing off Homer's Odyssey. He's never just translating it. There's always something creative and something, you know, questionable or mysterious that's going on, um, debatable. And then also they offer readings that they set within some of the most important readings, you know, over the course of um, readings of Joyce. So you get a sense of the history of reception of the episode, but in they all have a very light touch. There are all these essays are written to be read by, by anyone. Um, and so this is, um, you know, a book that kind of gives you a sense of where people are now, but it also gives you a sense of the discussion up to this point, you know, the hundred years that Joyce talked about, you know, of scholars puzzling. Maybe he said that, maybe he didn't. It was, but, a thousand, um, it was a thousand years, I think. A thousand years, exactly, exactly, a millennium. And so, but another thing that I've built into the book is um, Joyce himself is a reader of the text, correcting things. So his corrections are in the margins and in the footnotes to every page, along with the explanatory footnotes, you know, what does um, a particular word mean or what, you know, what, what phrase is referring to what, say, Shakespeare play are a set of references to Hans Walter Gabler's famous 1980s edition, the one that has supposedly 5,000 corrections um, of the first edition. Um, and, uh, and so I pull, a lot of those are to do with punctuation that doesn't impact very powerfully uh, on the meaning, but I include um, a whole set of references to his corrections that are interesting. And so as a reader, often I've found when I'm reading the first edition or any other edition, I wonder, what does Gabler have here, you know, and because they're very interesting inclusions. And so you can look back and forth between the different versions and get a sense of the history of reception of the text. And I think that's a very interesting thing because the, um, Joyce's book then is because it, it reveals its dynamic nature. And this, you know, this edition doesn't set out to be the perfect edition. Instead, it intends to give you a sense of the history of Joyce's text and for Joyce himself, too. And so there's an essay on the back that I co-wrote with Ronan Crowley, um, who's an expert in genetic criticism um, about the history of the text and the reason why it was so flawed when it came out and also why it became even more flawed over the years as various people attempted to correct it. But um, so this the, the, the reading experience is a dynamic one. You know, our, the frame is dynamic and then it intends to support the reader as they're grappling in a dynamic way with whatever sentence they're, re, they're rereading, to use your word, you know, that they're coming from because they're coming to again because either they've read the book before or they know that sentence from somewhere else, you know, um, like they've they've come across the phrase in a, in a play by Shakespeare that they had to read in school or that they saw a film adaptation of, or, or because it's circulating, circulating in popular discourse. Mm -hmm. So that is what Joyce was taking many of his references from, just the way that people speak. Yeah, songs, um, operas, 
all kinds of, you know, popular books, catchphrases, everything is recircul recirculated in Ulysses. Right. I think in the in the history of its reception, its uh, hundred years of fame or infamy, um, you know, it, it acquires the status of this hermetic text that has all these, you know, like, um, uh, you know, deeply secret meanings that you need, you know, mythic codes to to decode. Whereas so much of it is is it, when you look at an annotation, you see that so much of it is local reference. It's yeah. the day in the life of Dublin. Um, and that's why I wanted to ask us for the next question, uh, to, to look at an actual a page of this new edition. Uh, uh, Edgar, could you, could you get that up on the screen so that everyone can see this? Um, and I think you, you know, Catherine, you, you uh, kind of detail the features of, the, of each page. You know, at, uh, um, at the center of it, we've got the, the, you know, the printed edition uh, of 1922. And to the side, we've got uh, a record of Joyce's corrections to the text as well as uh, line number references to the Gabler edition. Uh, and at the bottom, those annotations of specific words and phrases. Uh, at the top, the chapter title, referencing uh, the corresponding episode in the Odyssey. Uh, uh, I think it's all constellated together in a way that has never been done before. At least I certainly don't recognize it, uh, maybe not even dreamt of. Uh, so I'm wondering, Dan, if could you speak to the way this, just looking at the page, uh, um, what what that page does to a reading experience? You know, I mean, I I often use the uh, you know the Penguin Student Edition, which has, but in that case, you have to keep flicking back and forth, mm -hmm. so it doesn't really encourage you to to actually um, explore the meaning uh, when you're reading page by page. So. What I could recommend here is that, you know, you could even read this book by sort of every night for a period of time. Just pick out a page and read the page and read the, you know, the marginal notes and then the notes at the bottom. And I think that would give that would give you a kind of a whole new it's a bit like reading. A, I often read a poem before I. Uh, you know, before I turn in for the evening, and I usually pick out some lines from my from my daily po Irish poetry tweet that I put out every every morning. But I usually, uh, you know, find the piece of poetry. So I read a poem and find a little piece to tweet the following morning. So I think you could use this book the same way. In in other words, take it page by page, and and you don't even necessarily have to read each page in sequence because each page has its own magic to it. And I think part of the value of Catherine's work and the work of the other uh, people involved is that that magic comes across on, on a single page instead of having to flick back and forth to the back of, uh, of, of a student edition and find the annotation concerned uh, or, or indeed have your, have your annotated guide or have your, have your annotation you know, in, in, in a separate book. This is just a, an extremely uh, easy and flexible way of accessing the text and commentaries on the text, which will lift the text from the page and enable the average reader, which is what I always think of the average reader, not, you know, I mean, not the kind of advanced student or the advanced academic, but the average reader, the person who reads, you know, a good newspaper, you know, I mean, reads books, um, you know, buys books, uh, goes to independent bookshops. That's the kind of reader. But that reader, I think, will, will, you know, will gain a lot from just looking at a page and seeing all of the riches that are embedded in that page, which otherwise might be difficult to access if you don't have everything laid out the way it is here. So Catherine, maybe you could speak to what you might think of as the, you know, the effect you might think this layout would have on a reader yeah. and yeah. that experience. Thanks for very helpfully talking about how this format works. That's the whole idea that this, you have everything in this book that you need. And so typically the problem that readers have is that they fall between, uh, you know, uh, the, the two stools of just the book or too much annotation, you know, often you, there's so much going on that the notes go on forever. And it's like a kind of bog that people get lost in, a kind of swamp they fall into. I mean, it's very, very interesting, but you'll never read Ulysses. Um, and then on the other hand, if you don't have anything, it can be very hard not to feel like you're just, not to feel demoralized. So my idea was to give readers just enough notes at the bottom of the page to help them get through the book. So, and it's amazing how much you can squeeze in. Like on average, there's something like 150 words of notes at the bottom of every page. 
On a more um, difficult pages, there are more notes, and on easier pages, there are far fewer notes. So you can tell at a glance how you know rich with references and um, difficult vocabulary a page will be just at a glance. But um, in this one, we can see um, Stephen is uh, on the beach uh, in Proteus, and he's thinking about um, his cousin. He's thinking about his visit to Paris. And uh, he's remembering Kevin Egan, um, who's a, a pseudonym of um, this Irish Fenian who's fled there. And he's thinking about um, all of the French things he used to say there, you know, the French beer and the mi setier, um, a quarter pint, and uh, the maid of all work. And so all of these um, French phrases are explain explained in the bottom. Um, the vieille graisse avec les dents jaunes, this idea of the of Queen Victoria as the old ogress with the yellow teeth, um, and uh, but also we get this uh, explanation of the um, escape from um, Redmond Jail in 1865, um, James Stevens' alleged escape, um, where it was rumored that he um, he got away uh, in disguise as a young bride. So these are really fun stories and fun references and. Uh, it's always nice to read about um, Stephen in Paris, you know, even if it was a kind of um, unsuccessful trip. But um, you, you get a sense of the kind of smattering um, of his, or the, the sort of vagaries of his thoughts and the kind of hodgepodge of references and this very rich kind of uh, textual fabric that, that he lives in, you know, the, the kind of stuff of his mind is um, extremely variegated. And, um, and so this is where handy reachable notes are um, really, I think, essential to um, some kind of appreciation. And I, I love Dan's idea that you'd read a page a night uh, because it, it really would be satisfying. It would be enough to bite into. And um, you could do it with this book. Just don't hold it over your head if you're sleepy, I would say. <laughs> you might crush yourself. Well, yeah. you can, you can maybe take a double course in literature and physical training uh, <laughs> with, with, with this volume. Uh, um, I mean, my own impression in, in encountering the page is, you know, when you're looking at, say, the Gabler edition, which is the teaching edition, there's a kind of icy glacier-like monumentality that you're alone with that page, like some kind of, it's almost like the, the blank page of the writing writer's anxiety but it's so yeah. colossal it's so the power dynamics are so are so strong here you're not alone it's yeah. like there's a conversation going on on the sidelines and you don't look it up you look down <laughs> and you see right away what you want to know uh so it's like being companioned from within the text and i find that really really agreeable and just less less alienating or, or not alienating, not scarifying, but companioning. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, too, I think, to see the details that Joyce was really interested in. Like mm -hmm. his correction there, you know, viewers might not see it. I had to open my own copy um, to, to read it. But the first note that Joyce makes is um, a correction of the word for Irishmen in French. And he doesn't want it capitalized. You know, mm -hmm. he he says for Irlande, read Irlande with a small I. And so I think that is that's a pretty interesting correction to make, you know. Um, yeah. Actually, that Irlande gives me a seg into this next question. It's sort of the biggest question and I think the most uh, uh, generative. It, and I'll, I'll start with you, Catherine. You know, as a scholar, um, you're working in a kind of literary historical time. Uh, you're looking at the book in its own moment, and you've situated it in a, in a memorable phrase as the self-articulation of a colonized country. Dan, you know, in, in, in a longer view, you know, drawing on your own global experience, Ulysses seems to emerge as something of a, a touchstone for Ireland in a new world order. You know, maybe even a tuning fork for the world as it might be. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, you know, that distinction is not necessarily a, a difference, let alone an antithesis. But I think I'm wondering if each of you could speak a bit more about your understanding of the place this novel takes in its world and in ours. And maybe then you could talk 
together about those several locations in time. You know, 1904 to 2022. <laughs> Dan, first? <laughs> well, yes, look, 1904 um, for me is um, a fascinating choice. I mean, obviously Joyce made it for his own personal reasons, the year he met or the time he met uh, Nora Barnacle for the first uh, time, the first time they walked out together. But historically, 1904 is exactly halfway between the death of Parnell and the Easter Rising. So there's something for me magical about that moment in time. So I see the novel as a kind of a, an exploration of Ireland on the cusp of dramatic political change, which happened uh, uh, 10 years later. Um, I'm conscious that the novel was written uh, at a time when that political change was taking place and the Parnellite world was being banished, pushed out uh, to the uh, to the edges, um, vanquished by the, you know, the, the kind of uh, revived Sinn Féin after the uh, Easter Rising in the election of, of 1918. I'm conscious of the fact that Joyce deliberately put into the novel where it was written, and also the years in which it was written. So 1914, 1921, so in European terms, First World War and aftermath, in, in Irish terms, um, you know, again, the revolutionary period. And I do think that Joyce was conscious of those things when he was writing his novel. I think there's a number of sort of hints in there that he was, that he understood that he was, that he was writing uh, about an Ireland that was undergoing dramatic change. And then today, I think, um, you know, for a long time, obviously, um, Ireland wasn't really uh, a country that beat its breast with pride in the achievement of uh, James Joyce's work. I think the change came and I was at, involved at the very beginning, 1982, the centenary of Joyce's birth. That was the first time when really the Irish state embraced James Joyce. And I think since then, we have presented Joyce uh, in a way as a kind of an epitome of the kind of Ireland, the kind of Ireland that has become a reality over the last 30 years. And in particular, Joyce's European uh, identity, his belief that Ireland needed to be more European, uh, chimes with the Ireland that has become more European in the last 30 years, and even more so now because of the impact of Brexit, which brings us closer to our European partners in the European Union and a little bit away, further away from the influence of our nearest neighbour. Um, Catherine? <laughs> yeah, and um, what a great contextualization. I mean, I think Joyce, you know, to put it in a different way, he deliberately set this novel at a quiet time in Irish history. He wrote it during a spectacularly eventful time, but he sets it in 1904, uh, a moment which I think Dan was suggesting is one of um, political stasis, stagnation, maybe despair. Um, for Ireland. And this was the moment where um, parla the parliamentary movement, parliamentarianism, had failed. And there wasn't yet the revolutionary energy that led to 1916, although it was circulating at the time that Joyce wrote the book. And also, you know, the War of Independence and then the Civil, well, moving into the Civil War, but uh, a little later. But the, so Joyce chose an ordinary moment. And I think that's very important for us reading it today because we always feel like we're in an ordinary moment, you know, even in our own lives. I mean, very few of us are ambassadors <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we lead lives that are pretty mundane. And so this is a book about ordinary people living in a world that bears the weight of history um, in which history has largely kind of uh, dictated the terms of their lives and against which they have to live or we have to live. So, you know, Haynes tries to absolve English people, maybe, you know, himself from um, blame when he says history, it seems, is to blame for what's happened to Ireland. Um, you know, he feels like a, he's trying not to make himself look unimportant um, or like a, like a villain. Um, but uh, the challenge that Ulysses um, stages is the challenge of um, asserting yourself in a meaningful way, living your life in a meaningful way in the world and the world as it is fully, not as created in some kind of 
genre novel, you know, science fiction novel, uh, a romance novel, uh, um, you know, a travel novel. It's it's the world in all of its complexity, um, commerce, politics, um, death, romance, or you know, love, family. Um, there's so many different dimensions are brought to bear in this world or um, registered in this world. And so this is why I think it's um, still so relevant for us, even though it's, you know, set now over 100 years ago and Ireland's changed a huge amount. The world's changed a huge amount since then. But it's still the modern world in being a place that's overwhelming, largely because um, not just because of the history that's gone before, but also because of these processes of uh, processes of dismantling that are going on these modern processes in which tradition and convention are being shredded and we're left with a sense of freedom, but also with a sense of um, feeling lost, you know, being forced to come up with their own answers. And so I think for Joyce, the moment is, is, uh, is the moment, you know, that it's said in a, at a particular historical moment, but it's always about the, the very moment in which you live. Um, you know, joy, uh, Bloom's thoughts, they're always centered. He always returns to the now and, um, you know, returning to his sensations, to his perceptions, to the, the present. And uh, this is in a way the, the big message of the book, you know, to wake up, um, to, to come back to yourself and to your immediate context and to grapple with that. I just remember something I heard from a, a student writing an exam on Chaucer said Chaucer was was sending a wake up call to the world in, in 1395. Uh, uh, um, but uh, about time, it's about time. You know, uh, I do have a couple of uh, uh, comments or questions from uh, in the Q and A, and I'm wondering if we could just get your responses to this one. It's 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 um, it's got some, it's, it's maybe 50 words long, but I think it's, it's, it's worth it. It's from Donald Thurlow. Uh, here, here is his, his comment. Uh, I think it comes, uh, it, it's a way of response to our recent conversation about the, you know, the politics and the history in the book. Leopold Bloom is the ultimate outsider. I moved to the UK in mid sixties as a 12 year old. I experienced plenty of anti-Irish feeling and was part of a minority. Catholic, 8% of the population. My first reading of Ulysses was a great comfort and affirmation, particularly Cyclops. This is often replicated in discussions I have been part of in Dublin, Trieste, and Zurich. A good, a good triangle there. So uh, Joyce as a comforter of the outsider. How about that? Uh, 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 Dan, could you speak to that? Yeah, Catherine, yeah that's, that? I, I, hmm. I've been intrigued by the fact that he chose as his three main characters, three outsiders, Bloom as a sort of a Jewish Hungarian background, suspected of being all sorts of terrible things, I and mean, Freemason, I, uh, and, and so forth, and, and, and a, a man of uh, uh, ungenerous attitudes in the pub, and, and all these things, all, all these terrible transgressions against decency. Uh, and then you have Molly, who after all, is half Spanish, uh, and she, you know, she's an exotic uh, in the Ireland of the early 20th century. And then you have Stephen Dedalus, who's exotic for different reasons. Well, his name is exotic, as Maliki Mulligan um, reminds us, but also he's he's exotic in his kind of mindset, which is very very different from the from the norm. So, so I do think that this is a. Uh, I've often been asked, why did Joyce choose to explore early 20th century Dublin through these three outsiders, these three untypical Irish people? And I think that was the point. I think he wanted to do that because he wanted to, to have a way of stepping back from the world that he so, um, so um, elaborately paints in the novel, that he wanted to have people who could be a little bit of a, uh, of a bounce from that world. And I think that's why he did it. And also, if you think about it, he wrote this novel uh, in, in three European cities, as he makes clear at the end of the novel. So again, there's this extraordinary approach of, of obsession with the Dublin of the early 20th century, while at the same time living his life in a very different environment in Trieste, a multicultural place where Bloom would not have been 
uh, and an outsider Bloom would have been sure. rather typical, maybe um, a person, you know, uh, doing the rounds in Trieste at that time. So would Molly. Um, uh, uh, Trieste was a very uh, literary place. I think Stephen Dedalus would have fitted in well there as well as, as as indeed Joyce did. So, so I think there's something intriguing about this kind of outsider insider thing that we get in Ulysses, where you know we are we are being brought into the center of the the forensically into the center of life in Dublin on a particular day in 1904. But at the same time, it's being done through the experience of people who are comparative outsiders and written by somebody who is an outsider, but 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 attached to the country in a way that very few people could ever be at that time. I mean, how he managed to to maintain a grip on what was happening in Ireland and, and, and on the reality of Ireland when he was so far away for so long has always intrigued me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, I think what's, you know, Ulysses is, you know, I, think, I love that idea that Joyce is the comforter of outsiders in Ulysses. And uh, Bloom is the consummate outsider. Um, he's not, you know, he's in a way, if he were born abroad, he would almost be less of an outsider. It's the fact that he's born in Dublin, but he's not accepted actually as Irish. That makes it really bitter, you know, that really casts him in a kind of um, as an excluded person. You know, he's tolerated. He's in the carriage on the way to Hades, on the way to the graveyard in the Hades episode. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's so many little moments where he's um, outside of the conversation. And they, those aren't even the moments where they talk about suicide being a bad thing. Bloom's father killed himself. They talk about, you know, Molly. They maybe don't know Molly's having an affair. But what I would say is that you could argue that every character in Ulysses is an outsider. Um, even the people who seem uh, secure, you know, all the men in the pub, um, say the men in the Cyclops episode, they're all kind of jockeying for position in the conversation. They're all trying to appear smart. There's a kind of, um, it's homosocial, you know, this is the way that men of that kind love to be together. One person tries to be smarter than the other, and it's kind of fun. But there's a kind of, um, there is no real way of being an insider in Ireland. Partly it's to do with this semi-colonial status, you know, um, like the Viceroy, uh, weirdly, is presented as an outsider in Wandering Rocks. He makes this grand procession through the city. And Joyce slightly fictionalized the events um, around the, vi the Viceroy's journey from the, the lodge, the Vice Regal Lodge in Phoenix Park, to the Mears Bazaar in Ballsbridge. You know, he opened the bazaar. In real life, the Viceroy did that, but it was a much more low-key affair. There was no pomp and ceremonies across the city. Joyce really expands on that, but he does so in order to deconstruct that pomp. So he pays more attention, arguably, to uh, minor characters, than he does to the Viceroy. And in the end, what we, we end with the, um, the sturdy trousers of Almidano Artifoni um, disappearing behind a closing door. And so this is, you know, an Italian Dubliner, an Italian Irishman mm -hmm. who is entering his house and potentially belongs in Dublin more than the Viceroy does. And so this is a book that really takes apart any system that would allow people to feel secure, actually. And um, uh, yeah, and this is, I think, why it's so powerful. We love Bloom as an outsider, but, uh, you know, maybe everyone is adrift in this book. You know, I, 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 I think, you know, it's a way of, it, it, there's a motive. I mean, why Joyce does this or that is a, is, is, a, is a long story and maybe an uncertain story, but I think there's a consistent effort to estrange the familiar, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and to and to de-essentialize anything, right? You know, uh, the citizen knows supposedly knows who he is and why he is. Uh, whereas I think everyone else, I think together, you give us a sense that this novel sort of dwells way out in the center. <laughs> you know, everyone is sort of disconnected from some, you know, guaranteed understanding of who they are. Yeah. And and but the citizen's an actor as well. I mean, the citizens. Uh... Yeah, he, I mean, he's a performance artist, really. He's, yeah, he's, he's right. there performing, uh, you know, and, and of course, you also realize that he's not too popular down in County Tipperary because of his, uh, his behavior down there at one point. So there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of skeletons in the in the citizens cupboard as well that we kind right. of uh, become vaguely aware of um, through uh, uh, through Joyce's um, work. Yeah, um, um, uh, one of the uh, comments in the Q and A uh, observed that uh, or asked uh, if uh, Bloom was the exiled Joyce, uh, which is an interesting way of thinking of it. Um, so I see that uh, Ray Ryan has uh, re-entered the zone of the visible. Um, <laughs> um, and I think Ray's going to wrap us up. Is that right? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Dan. And Thank all, you, of our, all the Catherine. audience. Well, it's been an absolutely engrossing hour. And um, I just want to thank everybody. We've had uh, comments come in from Paris, Pakistan, Barcelona, Peru, uh, from around US, and even from dear old Ireland. Um, what can I say? We're, we're, thank you very much, Vince. Um, thank you very much, Dan. It's you know extraordinarily good of you and your schedule to make time for us. Most of all, um, I want to thank Catherine Flynn. Um, I mean, her wonderful eloquence, easy eloquence on the text is just a joy to hear. Um, I hope, I think you'll all agree with me, she has a lovely voice as well and explains one of the reasons why her podcast has been so wildly successful. Catherine, you're, you're a voice for radio. It's, it's, it's lovely to listen to you. And you're um, you're a guide not just to the novel but on how to live. I was uh, I was enriched there at various levels. But look, this has been a special event. Um, here is the book again. It makes ideal summer reading the perfect Christmas gift, and no home should be without it. <laughs> um, yeah, wonderfully affordable price. I hope you all enjoy it as much as as we have. Thank you very much to everybody. Who's it's a beach it. novel after all. It's a beach novel published by Sylvia <laughs> Beach. And a, exactly. and a, be and right. a beach umbrella too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Ray. I mean, really, you know, thank you so much for your support with this project. It was really wonderful to have your backing with this and your recognition that this would work, you know. Um, I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. But um, the, the two stars of, of today have made it possible are Catherine and Joyce. And, and thank you very much. For, for an engrossing hour and once again to, to Vince and, and perhaps especially, I you know Vince will understand, to Ambassador Daniel Mulhall in an extraordinarily busy schedule to take the time to be with us today. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. I, I think we should applaud Catherine. Well, thank you.